Our scripture this morning is a Pentecost scripture because we're talking about the Holy Ghost today as we continue on with the Apostles' Creed. And it is from Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared, he being Jesus, to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. And once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And he replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. As we continue in our, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we continue in our sermon series on the Apostles' Creed this morning, we come to the words that state, we believe in the Holy Spirit. I think about those last words when the Holy Spirit came and uh, settled upon them and just overwhelmed them and they began to speak in other tongues. And of course in this it says speak in other languages. But it was, uh, there, there's so many stories over the course of time that are not even recorded in the Bible that were hundreds of years after uh, Jesus was resurrected and went to heaven after the Holy Spirit came to be among us. And uh, they're just awe-inspiring of people who, you know, were imprisoned and, and you know, people were there to mediate on their behalf and try to get them to set these prisoners that were imprisoned because of their faith in Jesus, you know, wrongly imprisoned in foreign countries like Germany and places like that. And they would go in and, and uh, speak, not knowing German, but they'd go in and try to communicate and the prisoners would be set free and they, they'd walk out and, and one of the uh, missionaries with them would say, there's, there's many stories, there's one, I should have gotten the book that it was recorded in for you, but um, there were two missionaries, missionaries in one case when this happened and they did set the prisoners free and, and they, the Germans were just so cooperative with them, they just were taken aback and when they were walking out, the second missionary asked the first one, he's like, I had no idea you spoke German. We were so worried about not being able to communicate with them and, and there you were, like you just grown up speaking it your whole life and here they are free because of what you said. He's like, I wasn't speaking German. He's like, I was just speaking English. He's like, oh no sir, you were speaking German. And he was like, they were so confused. Because what it was in his brain and what he heard with his own ears was English, but what everyone else in the room heard was German. And that is what happened on that day of Pentecost. And it says, the Holy, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other language, languages as the Holy Spirit gave them an ability. And I'll talk more about this on 
Pentecost, but um, these people up in the upper room, there were about 120 of them, they all just started speaking all these other languages and people had gathered in Jerusalem because it was the high and holy weekend. They were there for um, a feast and everyone wanted to celebrate the Jewish feasts where the tabernacle was. So they'd come from all the different countries and had learned to speak those languages. And while they were down, roaming around in the city, they heard, you know, like when the wind makes sound travel, they heard all these people testifying to the resurrection of Jesus Christ in their own language. And that's why they thought they were all drunk at first. And they're like, well, no, they're not drunk. They're speaking very clearly in, in Aramean or whatever the case was. And it was miraculous. And it was by the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit. In our scripture this morning, Jesus told the disciples, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John 14, 26 calls this gift of the Holy Spirit the helper. Trying to do anything in our walk of faith without the help of the helper who is the Holy Spirit, is like trying to push a car up a hill instead of putting gas in the tank and driving it. It could be done, but it's pretty silly. It's a shame, in my opinion, how few Christians truly believe in the awesome power of the Holy Spirit. They acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, but that is as far as many Christians are willing to go in their understanding of who the Holy Ghost is. I wonder why that is. I believe it's because it requires us to believe that the invisible God we worship and believe in might in fact show himself in a visible and tangible way even here, even now, in this very moment, at this very location. It seems a little too much for many Christians to get comfortable with it. It's far more comfortable just walking out our faith without any expectations of such spiritual disruptions that might challenge us, that might rattle our proverbial Christian cages. Bring up the gifts of the Holy Spirit like healing and prophecy and divine dreams and visions. And many Christians will take a step back because you're a little too out there for them and their level of Christian comfort. Tell someone that you actually saw an angel or had an open eyed vision and they will courteously nod their head and smile, not believing a word of it. <laughs> but of course, not wanting to hurt your feelings. Talk about praying in tongues. The prayer language spoken throughout all of the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit gives believers who seek it. And watch the way people begin to respond differently to you. Tell someone that you witnessed a miraculous healing. That a child's crippled feet were made straight. I've seen it. That a friend's stage four cancer is completely gone. That someone deaf can now hear by the awesome and mighty healing power of the living God. And there will be part of them that might really want to believe that it is true, but the predominant part of them will believe that surely there has to be a medical explanation. We want a faith that is comfortable. If we're honest, we want a faith that's predictable. But show me one example in the Bible where the faith God requires his people to have is within their comfort zone. <laughs> we could go down the list. You won't find it. Because our God is always stretching us and calling us to step away from our own understanding and our own expectations of what really is possible through him. 
so he can demonstrate his amazing power and glory in our midst. His demonstration of his glorious power is through the third person of the Holy Spirit, I mean of the Holy Trinity, who is the Holy Spirit. I've had so many people ask me in, in congregations that I've pastored, tell us a little more about the Holy Spirit because I've just never really understood that. And people have this concept that the Holy Spirit is just the presence of God. If just the presence of God isn't enough. But I mean, they, they, they think it's um, just the Spirit of God just hovering in our midst, the, the holy presence of God. But Jesus is very clear in Scripture. And I didn't put the book and verses in here this morning. But he's very clear in Scripture. He says, I have to go there so he can come here. If I don't, go up there and sit at the right hand of God, Father Almighty, then the Holy Spirit can't come here. And he calls him a he, not an it, not a sensation, not um, just a presence. He's the third person of the Trinity. And it just, it warps our minds. We just can't, it just bends our mind. We're like, how can that be? But it's God. <laughs> I mean, God is mystery. Our Heavenly Father didn't send us the Holy Spirit. And here, here's a, I really want to make this point. And I'm, and I'm talking not to you specifically, of course. I'm just talking to so many Christians I've come in contact with. But the Heavenly Father didn't send us the Holy Spirit as some optional resource to walk out our faith with. And this morning when I was going over my sermon and I was praying, and the Holy Spirit gave me this illustration. It's almost like when we become Christians, it's as if when we get to the certain point, like the waiter comes to our little proverbial Christian table and he's like, now, um, would you like to walk your faith out with the Holy Spirit? And, you know, would you like to lay your hands on people and, and heal by the power of God, would you like to speak in tongues or, or do you prefer not to have those things, you know? I mean, like he, like we think there's some checkoff list. It's like, yeah, I'll, I'll do Christianity without that if you're okay. But that is not what Jesus said before he left this earth. He said, I've got to go there so he can come here and you're going to need him. And he's going to empower you. He is going to be the helper. It's a big deal. And it's a shame how few Christians truly believe in the awesome power of the Holy Spirit. It's like we want to compartmentalize it or minimize it or something because it's just more comfortable. I mean, because truly, if Holy Spirit is working in our midst, that means he might start doing stuff that we're not savvy to. <laughs> you know, he, he might just start showing up in ways that make us a little uncomfortable. It's far more comfortable just walking at our feet without any expectations of things like that. But he is our helper. He's the advocate. He's the third person of the Trinity that we call the Holy Ghost. And when we consider that Jesus knew how critical his final words to the disciples were going to be, let's not think that those were just words of coincidence, that they were just an afterthought, that Jesus had walked this earth for 40 days after he was resurrected. And this was the day when he was going to ascend up into heaven and he would just be like, oh yeah, by the way. <laughs> Come on. He knew that those disciples present would be lingering on every last word he had to give them while he was present with them. And he Scripture doesn't say it, but we can honestly conclude that they were well 
thought out, precise, and probably even strategic words that they would cling to and linger on, words that we would. And those words were, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It was important that he knew. I mean, that he let them know, hey, get this. <laughs> This power from our divine helper, the Holy Spirit, it's not the power of positive thinking. It is not the willpower to do what is right in the eyes of God. It is not anything that we can do or muster up in our own human strength. It is the heavenly power of the Holy Ghost that comes from knowing Him and relying on Him and being empowered by Him. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was placed in the womb of a virgin over 2,000 years ago. And it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that redemption and healings and resurrections and miracles were commonplace in the three and a half year ministry of Jesus. In the ministry of the disciples. Even in the ministry of John Wesley. We know good and well we're not throwing the baby out with bathwater, right? John Wesley was a good, holy man. And he had a very good idea on living out your faith. It was not good preaching or good works. It was the power of the Holy Spirit. And nothing has changed except our expectations. It's the Holy Spirit that pierces a sinner's heart to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts us in our own hearts when we have sinned. It's the Holy Spirit that calls people onto the mission field. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit that people, even today, are healed. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. It is through our relationship with the Holy Spirit that we are given the ability to receive prophetic words and visions and dreams. And it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that miracles signs and wonders are manifested among followers of Jesus Christ even today. Scripture tells us in the book of Acts that over 3,000 people accepted Christ as their Savior and that day that the Holy Spirit poured out on all of those 120 disciples in the upper room. 3,000 people. I looked up the population of Wilson. And that is over two times all the people in Wilson. Acts 2 verse 41 tells us, Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. What's the population of Lone Grove? Any idea? 5,000? We're talking about the scoffers, the naysayers, the crowds who were only seven weeks earlier yelling, crucify him. Those are the people that were saved. Thousands were converted to Christianity when the apostle Peter stepped out on that balcony after being filled with the Holy Spirit and testified to the truth regarding the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God. And the conversion of the masses, hear me on this, it was not due to the power of an influential speaker. Peter was a fisherman by trade. And not an eloquent speaker on any level. He's more of a kid. <laughs> he was not a member of the debate team. Nor was he a member of the local Toastmasters Club. He was just a blue-collar fisherman. 
Yet thousands of people came to believe that Jesus Christ truly was the long-awaited Messiah because Peter, being filled and empowered with the Holy Ghost, walked out there anointed and empowered and preached the gospel and people turned their hearts to God. John 14, 16 tells us, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Notice it doesn't say for a while. And notice like some denominations teach, it doesn't say until the last disciple dies. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard that or not, but a lot of people believe that the healings and the prophecies and all those don't happen because it died out with the last apostle. And like, show me a scripture that says that. Because it does not. Jesus said, greater works will you do. Because I go. <laughs> there. And the helper comes here. It says he, the helper, will be with us forever. Our power as Christians comes from the Holy Spirit, our divine advocate. But unfortunately, many Christians leave that power untapped. We feel the Holy Spirit tug at our hearts when something isn't right. We feel the Holy Spirit nudge us to help someone in need. We often sense the Holy Spirit when we worship and pray. But most Christians still leave much of what the Holy Spirit can help us and empower us with on the proverbial table. But believe it or not, that is certainly not who John Wesley was and not what he taught. Stories of the power of the Holy Ghost manifesting in the ministry of John Wesley are documented all throughout his journals. I encourage you to read them. They are fascinating. It, I struggle a little bit with that old formal English that he <laughs> writes with, but I find it quite enduring in how he describes things. And I've shared with you like Thunderstruck jumps out of me, but um, the way that he describes to the best of his ability how when people are overwhelmed with the Holy Spirit, what he's seeing with his physical eyes and how he describes it in Old English, is, it's, it's fascinating. He witnessed physical healings. He prayed for his horse when they had, because you know he was like the first circuit rider, right? And his horse, just, what do they say, on his last leg, you know, and just was too weary to go on. And, and John Wesley came to the conclusion that well, he's God's creation too. And he began to lay hands on his hand, a horse, and prayed for him. And just miraculously, he was refreshed and renewed and they continued on in their journey. That's why when people ask me, like, should I pray for my pets? I'm like, of course, that's God's creation. Why would he? He cares for the sparrow, right? John Wesley cast out demons. And he even prayed for a dead man that he describes in his journals had been dead for so many hours that his body had grown cold, he says. But he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. We frequently talk about Wesley's heart being strangely warm when he had this first encounter with the Holy Spirit at Aldersgate, but that was just the turning point. That was just like the starting gate of what he experienced with the Holy Ghost. Unfortunately, over the last century in particular, the high society members of the Methodist denomination, we were talking earlier, because they were looking at deeds, you know, there was the Brethren Methodist, and there was the Methodist Episcopalians, and, and you know, of course, the United Methodist, and there's the Free Methodist and all of this, but... Back in the early 1900s, the high society members of the Methodist denomination did not like all this Holy Ghost business. And they began to minimize it and kind of push it back because it was, in their opinion, if you read the uh, historical writings on it, it was just too uncivilized. Well, it is. Because you can't constrain the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you can, well, you can quench him. You cannot allow him to move in your midst. 
because you will quench the Holy Spirit. But if you're going to yield to Him and surrender and say, Lord, do what you want to do, it might freak us out a little bit, but you do it. This is, this is your kingdom, and He'll do it. It reminds me of 1 Timothy 3, which tells us, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. We are in those last days. Whether Jesus comes in our lifetime or comes 10 years from now or 100 years from now, we are most definitely in the last days. I think we can all agree to that. Many prophecies have been fulfilled. The writing is all over the wall. Jesus is coming soon. And we need to be ready. And we need to make our, sure that our children and their children and their children's children are ready. And I'm not talking about our salvation in Christ. I'm, we obviously need to have that taken care of. I'm talking about being the fully adorned bride of Christ. Fully ready and equipped and empowered to receive the groom when he arrives. Because remember, he's going to come to his bride who is walking in that full glory without spot or wrinkle. Lord have mercy, we got a ways to go. And if Jesus doesn't return in our lifetime, we certainly don't want to leave our children and grandchildren behind with a powerless faith. It's going to get ugly. I mean, it's ugly now, right? We get glimpses of all of that now. But what goes on in our midst right now will pale in comparison to what Scripture describes as the, the, the few last days before the return of Christ. And we can teach our children to be great do-gooders in this world, to have godly morals and principles, fighting for the underdogs of society and righting every social wrong, all of which the church should be doing. But how is that going to help them when all hell breaks loose? It's only the Holy Spirit that will empower us and them to walk in the power of God, dispelling all the darkness wherever we go. Fully equipped to effectively fight the good fight when evil is all around us. And I'm not talking doomsday, I'm just talking <coughs> scripture. Because <laughs> the day will come and, and it's going to, we know, we've read it, right? So yes, the Apostles' Creed proclaims that we believe in the Holy Spirit. As I said, I can't tell you how many times congregation members have come to me and asked me to explain more about the Holy Spirit to them. And they'd be, they'd be dismayed that they hadn't heard more about it in their upbringing. Because see, pastors have done a really good job about teaching about God the Father. And about Jesus, the Son of God. But we've done a pretty poor job preaching and teaching about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. We profess in our creed that we do in fact believe in the Holy Spirit, but stating it in our creed is not enough. We must learn how to walk out what we say we believe. And the Lenten season is an excellent time to adjust our course and to seek a better understanding of the deeper things of God. I had someone tell me in another church that I served, it was from the, their previous pastor. And I preached on things like this and, and he said, I'm just going to tell you this in love. You know, stop giving them meat. And, and this is not a reflection on you, I'm just telling you this story that happened. Stop giving them meat when all the world's milk. He said, you're going to make him choke. And I looked at him and I said, if you've been a Christian 
for two, three, four, five, six decades. It's time to understand the deeper things of God. It's time. It's not your fault, anyone's fault, if, they, if it's been left out, if it's not been emphasized, if it's not been included in sermons or Bible studies, it's not your fault. I mean, you come to church to learn and, and to be poured into. But it's time. Because Jesus is coming back. And we need to fully understand even those deeper things of God. We need to cultivate an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit, not just Father God and Jesus, but also the Holy Spirit. And to be clear, I want to emphasize that we most certainly will get to heaven without doing so. <laughs> but Jesus calls us to have higher goals than just getting to heaven. He calls us to do the stuff, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, to lay hands on the sick and pray for them so they'll be healed. He calls us to do the works that he did, to continue on his ministry, not some watered-down version of it. It's who he calls us to be. He calls us to help others find their way to heaven. He calls us to lay our hands on the sick so they'll be healed. He calls us to be fully adorned and empowered as the, body, the bride of Christ. And all of that requires us to learn how to co-labor with the blessed third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost. We believe in God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We believe in Jesus, the Son of God. And we believe in the Holy Ghost. Let us pray. Father God, we love you so much. It's so much to wrap our mind around when we think of the Trinity. We think of that you all are three separate persons, yet you're the same. It's so much for our human minds to comprehend. Forgive us for the times when we haven't pursued the deeper understanding of those things. So at least try to, to at least be willing to grapple with what that means for us right here and now as your children, as your representatives on this earth. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, to come now. Come, Holy Spirit, like you did in that mighty mission win for those 120 disciples in that upper room. Come and fill us. Dispel any fear, any doubt, any hesitancy, any skepticism. Just wash it all away, Jesus, with your blood. And Holy Spirit, fill us. Not to the expectations of what other people say that will look like or feel like. Not for what I even describe, or just fill us how you choose. Fill us until we're overflowing. Empower us. We truly want to be the people that are walking in the power that you desire us to so we can make a difference for the kingdom in this world. And we thank you for your patience as we continue to imperfectly progress toward who you've created us to be. But help us to always have a surrendered heart, to lay down any preconceived notions of, of how we think being the deeper Christian would be, and to just be empty vessels for you to fill and use however you choose, Father. It's all about you. And we thank you that you love us. That you love us so much. In the name of your son we pray. Amen.